Hey, what's up? Welcome back to the Less Invasive Podcast, your source for minimally invasive surgery, robotics, and other assistive technologies for the operating room and radiology environment. If you haven't done already, please take five minutes to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, uh, maybe write a little review and share with a friend. That will help uh, this content reach more people. Uh, today, uh, this show is reaching uh, thousands of people in over 40 countries, uh, mostly Europe and North America, but uh, also Middle East, uh, Asia, Latin America and Africa. I'm your host, Lucien Bordel, co-founder and CTO of Quantum Surgical, a startup commercializing the EPN robot for percutaneous tumor ablation. I bring to the table 20 years of experience in imaging and robotics for various specialties, orthopedics, neurosurgery, spine surgery, interventional radiology, and interventional oncology. Today, I'm very excited uh, to have Dr. Vanash Patel on the show. So Dr. Patel is a board certified general surgeon with a specialist interest in colorectal surgery, practicing in London and Hertfordshire in England. Uh, he has been uh, using the Versus robot from British company CMR Surgical uh, for quite some time. I uh, started in uh, July or August last year. And uh, we'll, talk, uh, we'll talk about that. So this uh, new robot for soft tissue surgery has been launched in 2019. And today there are over 100 units installed uh, across Europe, uh, but also Asia, Australia, Latin America, and the Middle East. And the specialties uh, in which this robot is used are gynecology, colorectal, thoracic general, and urology. Moving on to uh, the purchasing process and implementing a program, because uh, you mentioned this uh, uh, greater adoption of robotics to, uh, to, to, to various uh, health care centers. Um, your hospital, I understand, was the first in the UK to install two versus systems simultaneously. Uh, so it's been quite a, quite a challenge, I guess, to, uh, to, to make this happen uh, at, the, at the hospital. Several questions about the purchasing, because uh, a lot of surgeons are probably mm -hmm. interested in um, you know, getting a, a robot and having uh, the hospital administration uh, go through this, uh, this process. Did this uh, NHS Trust uh, previously had uh, surgical robots? And uh, what led to the decision to acquire a robotic system? So... So yeah, the, the business case is an interesting, interesting one because it, it, it's always uh, quite difficult to buy something expensive, particularly within within the National Health Service because it's a government-run organisation and there's always no money, uh, and that's the first thing that everyone says: there's no money, you can't buy this. Yeah. But actually, um, it's not it's not really about money. It's about the, the main thing is about strategic context and, and what does the robot bring to your unit apart from the money side of money side of things and. Um, and, and what what the robot brings to your unit is, you know, of course, better. Uh, you know, it's a better way of operating. Uh, you know, the evidence now is beginning to show that robotic surgery has better clinical outcomes. So, so that's that's one thing it will definitely start to bring. But it also brings in, um, you know, better recruitment. So your surgeons that are going to come into your your hospital. You know, if if you don't have a robot and the, the neighbouring hospital has a robot, they're going to go and work in the hospital that has a robot. And we found that our recruitment has been much better after we've got robotic systems in our trust. We don't find it difficult now to recruit surgeons, okay? good quality, high quality surgeons. Um, it brings uh, ergonomics, you know, better ergonomics. Your, your surgeons will last longer operating in this way. You know, they will have a much longer career and, and a, much, a much healthier career. Um, it, you know, it brings around um, a better, higher profile for the trust. Um, uh, and with this sort of innovation, uh, it brings new innovation and it, and, and it can um, inspire other people to, to start their own other innovative ideas within the trust. So innovation always brings innovation. Yeah. Uh, and you actually start seeing that um, um, your, your, the profile of your trust starts, start, starts, getting, starts getting better. And, and one of the main things that it has brought is it's, it, you know the, the actual the, the morale of the staff is much better um uh, you know we were traditionally doing a lot of laparoscopic surgery and it was becoming very you know we were doing very good laparoscopic surgery but people were getting bored and not challenged anymore and by bringing the robotics robotic systems in the the actual the allied healthcare professionals the theater system, the theater staff have become a lot um you know they're, they're just much 
much more happier to come to work and, and, and work on the robotic cases and, and, and they found it it's a new challenge so 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 all in all you've got to think about all those different aspects when you're think, thinking about your business case because it's not just about the money side of things because um these sorts of um strategic these these sorts of this sort of strategic context will actually um translate into economical benefits in the long term okay so i i understand that that uh, you had to um to explain the benefits for the patient first uh, for the physician and, and for the mm -hmm. hospital uh can you can you share how you were involved uh, as a surgeon in the in the decision making process how you partner with other surgeon and the administration to move this this business case forward yeah so so it was um you know uh, i i wanted to do robotics I, i knew that this is the way forward um um and uh, essentially was when you're bringing this sort of system into the hospital this sort of innovation to the hospital it's expensive so um you you do need um you know originally i thought well we could just get one for our colorectal department but but it doesn't just work as a as a single specialty tool so we branched uh, to a multi specialty program and once you've got multiple specialties on board then actually the financial um analysis is much better and it actually becomes cost effective um and and over the long term you know we we are going to see cost savings doing robotic surgery so um just looking at um you know our financial analysis uh, by year three, year four, our robotic operations are going to be cheaper than our traditional laparoscopic operation and that's because we brought in a, a, a vast variety of specialties um i think the most challenging thing is to um get everyone aligned to your same vision because yes i wanted to get a robotic system but there are people in that you work with who think actually this is not the right thing to do and there are people that you know get you know think that this is totally the right thing to do and actually you need to align everyone to your to your vision um uh, and move forward as a cohesive group because if you don't if there's lots of arguments between colleagues you'll never get the robot into your hospital uh, and actually you do have to settle on on which system you want to buy and, and procure because yeah. if you're arguing about getting a da vinci system or a cmr and your colleagues can't decide which one you want to get you'll never get a robot um so everyone has to go right this is the robot we want to get and we'll get this robot and 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 it will come to your come come to your come to your hospital okay so you are uh, pretty much uh, the choose the, the the robot model before you you started the the purchasing process you said okay this is yeah i mean we, what we, we want we, because we, of this and that yeah i mean we we were we were kind of limited in terms of you know because we had um our operating theaters in two different blocks so uh, yeah okay. we couldn't That's have constraint. we couldn't have it was a constraint a big constraint mm. for us and we couldn't just have a dedicated robotic theater and, and so we needed that flexibility so so that's why we chose this robot um and, and everyone agreed you know this was probably the right fit for our unit at, at this present moment in time um uh, and because we agreed on that robot we could focus our attention on on how we're going to purchase this robot and all our sort of cost analysis is based on this robot and how much it costs and what the consumables are and the servicing cost and and I think and and, and that's why um I think that's why we managed to build a very strong business case and in fact we were only going for one robotic system but the business case was was strong and we had a lot of support from our uh, executive leadership and 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 they saw they saw the sort of vision and they, they were strongly aligned to the st strategic context um that actually when it went to the trust board uh, and they said well we should get two systems because you're going to be asking for another system in a year's time and we might as well just invest in this now uh, rather than coming back in a year's time saying can we have another robot let's just get two now and let's build a build a robotic center of excellence so so it is it is it, it is everyone being aligned to the same vision from the very top down to the very bottom and and everyone has to everyone has to be on board i think Yeah, I mean that uh, the purchasing of uh, two robots at the same uh, uh, right from the start uh, tells about the, you know the vision and and the strategic uh, initiative at the, at this hospital. I've been working in surgical robotics for 20 years, and most of the time you have a hospital that is buying one robot, and then after a couple of years they say, okay, it's great, but um, the other surgeon wants also to 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 operate with the robot, and then you you purchase a second uh, robot, and and that tells that the, the people are actually happy and. Uh, uh appreciate the the benefit of the robot but uh, uh buying two for, right from the start if you can that's a that's a smart move so 
I read an article, um, I think you, you, earlier this, this month, uh, you talked about a national strategy that will democratize access to, uh, to robotic surgery. You talked about a, a standardized business case that could uh, fast track procurement of robotic system within the, the NHS. Can you elaborate a, a little bit on this? Yeah, so um, we can't have a postcode lottery where, you know, someone who lives in my catchment population gets a robotic cancer operation, but someone who lives uh, in the catchment area of the neighbouring trust who doesn't have a robot doesn't get a robotic operation. Um, uh, and there's lots of different reasons why trusts won't get a robot. And, you know, sometimes it's to do with the leadership and sometimes it's to do with the clinicians. But if that all doesn't line up and, and that trust never gets a robot because there's no strategy or vision or, you know, or maybe they need a little bit of help. Um, you know, having a national program or a national strategy saying that this is what we need to do in five years time. Everyone needs to have a robot in their unit so that they can be doing robotic operations. And this is the framework and, and this is the business case um, that would make it easier for, for, for hospitals to buy robots. And if everyone buys robots then the more robotic surgery that's done, the better the, the better the data, the, the, you know, you will then see that the, the robots get better the, the, and the, the out, clinical outcomes of the patients get better. Um, so um, it, it's, a, it's a bit like a strategy for, you know, the government saying drive the electric car, you know, by 2030, we want everyone to drive an electric car. We should have that for, for robotic surgery, you know, and the government should say that, you know, every NHS trust in England who was doing colorectal cancer needs to get a robot by 2025 you know uh, and this is how you do it and we will support it and that way i think people will get access to robotic surgery and and, uh, and it wouldn't have to be you know um a postcode lottery mm, okay i understand so now moving on to uh you purchased the, the robot and you you plan to uh, implement a robotics program in your in your um, hospital so you you touched a little bit uh, about that uh, already how you trained uh, several teams and, and and the processes you went through this uh, this phase which advices would you give to a surgeon who are planning to implement a robotics program are there specific uh, steps to follow or uh, things to 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 be careful uh, about uh, to introduce a, a new robot um i think i think the most important step is to be passionate about it and be motivated um, uh, and, and, and champion it and, and talk about it a lot and, and tell everyone about it. Um, because the more people that know about it in the hospital, um, the more people will want to get it. Um, uh, and often the challenges are, are often met at, um, you know, whenever you're in a big institution, there's lots of hierarchy and levels to sort of go through the procurement process. And, and actually sometimes um, approaching the, the actual executive leadership um it helps a lot because um they have strategy and vision and, and it's probably closely aligned to the clinicians because you're all working for the for the benefit of the patients and actually making them your first point of call saying look i've got this fantastic idea is it going to work they're probably going to go yes it will uh, uh, and if if your leadership is 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 aligned to your vision um things will happen in, in the hospital and your robot will come um so so uh, that's my top tip is to sort of there's you'll always get obstacles and challenges and people and people and uh, things trying to stop you from from making this sort of expensive purchase but actually you just need to keep pushing 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 um and every time you meet an obstacle just move sideways and try it from a different approach um and eventually eventually the, the business case will come and the robot will, will be in your institution um the other the other tip is to um when you're putting a business case in for a robot is to make sure it's completely detailed. So you've got fine detail all, all written down. So, you know, you don't really want any surprises and you don't want any, um, you don't, you don't want to take it to the, to, to board level and, and they're scrutinizing it and, and you've missed out sort of the fine details that then would give them the excuse to throw the business case out. You want, you want it to be a bulletproof, business case that they want to look at and go this is fantastic and pass it through at the first 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 time because as soon as something gets thrown back at you it kind of loses its momentum and, and you need mm -hmm. to grasp that momentum so okay so i understand that it's a it's a lot of work it's a lot of energy and it's fueled by a patient to uh, make the purchase and introduce a, a robotics uh, program into a, a hospital like the uh, nhs trust 
Uh, so moving on to, uh, we're close to the end of this episode. So I just have a couple of que side questions uh, about emerging technologies. So um, like other companies, CMR Surgical uh, uh, has a telepresence solution so that uh, during a robotic cases, you can have a telementoring, a remote case support. So I think in England, it's uh, through uh, a collaboration with the Surge Ease Innovations, a medtech startup, mm -hmm. so where you have a monitors, camera, sound systems that allow people outside uh, remotely, like trainers, surgical preceptors, to uh, provide some kind of guidance and uh, technical assistance. I think you tried uh, this uh, this system. How, how does it work? And what are your feedbacks on this uh, technology? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer, so, but, but I'm biased to uh, technology. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we tried out telementoring. Um, essentially, it's um, uh, cameras, microphones within the operating space and, and you know, in, in the sort of remote areas um, uh, and with screens on the on the robotic console, screens on the patient, screen in the operating theatre and, and bilateral communication between the, the mentor and yourself. And I, th I think there's definitely a role and especially... Um, you know, at the moment with with CMR Surgical, um, you know there are, there are systems within the NHS, but there's not a, not a huge volume, which means that preceptors can can come to the hospital and 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 mentor and train you face to face. But there's going to come a point where there are lots and lots of different systems and lots of different robotic platforms within hospitals within the NHS trusts, and you're not going to be able to get you know proctors and preceptors to come to your hospital and sit with you. So I think this is definitely a viable alternative to make sure that we don't we can build up robotic surgery at speed and and you know we can you know we can have preceptors from different parts of the country mentoring robotic surgery happening in other parts of the country um, uh, and it, it's it you know it it, it remember that the, the the preceptors and proctors are not there to teach you how to do the operation they're te they're teaching you how to use the robotic system so uh, and I think that's why telementoring works so. Um, you know, if you're going to teach someone how to do an operation, you need to actually be there. But actually, if you're teaching them how to use a technology or innovation, then you don't need to be sitting face to face with each other. You can you know, do it remotely and, and it doesn't have to be all remotely. It can be part part face to face and then move on to remotely. Uh, and it's just another another support network, I think, that, that, that definitely needs exploring. Okay, interesting. So another uh, emerging technology is uh, virtual reality. So it has been uh, used like in uh, orthopedics for kind of uh, complex cases with uh, complex workflow, a lot of instruments, uh, a lot of different implants to, uh, in the virtual space, uh, simulate the procedure, the different steps, uh, take the instruments, perform some surgical tasks. And uh, so CMR has brought this kind of uh, virtual reality uh, training uh, with a virtual reality headset and, and uh, I've, I've seen this uh, this video where you can see like you are uh, the nurse uh, docking the instrument on the on the arm and moving the arm and it's quite different from what has been the, the standard of uh, surgical training and simulation like that was uh, up to now just simulating the anatomy and, and the instruments so uh, can you share have you tried this uh, virtual reality uh, uh, training and what it's like what's the benefit so, so I haven't personally tried the virtual reality training because I was on the sort of more conventional training when when, um, when I was doing my robotic training. But some of my colleagues have tried it out. Um, uh, again, it's definitely innovation that that needs exploring because um, what we find now in our trust is that you know training is it takes a lot of time up and and you know you can't you can't go up to CMR headquarters and you know it's difficult to take take a whole day out yeah. and your staff go up there and get trained and sometimes it's not convenient and, and actually doing a virtual reality type training um would you know so saves time it's more cost effective can tr train a larger volume of, of people um more quickly um uh, and um uh, yeah I, I definitely see the value in that and i think that's definitely uh, the way forward as well okay last question about technology so there is this uh, versus connect that is uh, an application on, on smartphone i guess uh, to uh, to for surgical video management and data analytics mm -hmm. to, to tell you how many procedures you've done which kind of instruments automatically i guess um, detect uh, some some phases in in the procedures and some timings um do you use this app and what kind of data are you looking in, into this this app uh, so I haven't actually started using this app at the moment, okay. um, but I will do. Um, it is very, it, it, it does capture a lot of data. And I think it, 
I think it's useful for the individual clinician just to look at their own data or data capture and look at how they can reflect on their operating and, and make your operating better. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the problem is there's so much innovation and technology around now that, you know, it's just another thing to do. And you, yeah. you kind of want to do the operation and then and then use a sort of app. And, you know, so I, I think we, we, we'll do it step by step. But I think I will, I will eventually use the app. But I haven't actually used it at the moment. Okay, interesting. So yeah, I, I like this approach to uh, introduce uh, technology step by step and uh, and uh, and wait for uh, having completed the first step uh, before going to the yeah. next one. And, and that's uh, that's anyway uh, something that you will be able to do uh, in the future. So last question is um, about the remote surgery. So uh, the, the the first uh, the actually um, remote surgery between uh, France and uh, New York that happened in 2001. So that's quite uh, two decades ago. Uh, now we've seen we've seen many more uh, surgical robots with the teleoperation that could enable this uh, really remote uh, surgery. What's your take on the remote surgery? Is it a topic that uh, is of interest for you, and do you see this happening in the, in the uh, future, short, mid, or long term? I think it's. I don't. I don't think for 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 the United Kingdom in the NHS setting. I think that might be. Um, it's probably not as applicable maybe to other sort of uh, larger countries where they have, you know, different sort of hospitals set up where they've got rural hospitals and urban hospitals, and you might not have the specialist expertise in a rural setting and you can't fly the patient out. So that's potentially a use of that. I think within the sort of national health service in the United Kingdom, I think we, we do have um, centralized services, but they're all very co-located to the regional centers. So, so uh, I don't think that would be the first thing that would pop into my mind when we're talking about robotic surgery and remote surgery. Um, but you know, uh, you know what innovations like it, it would, if it takes off, it takes off, and suddenly you know we're all doing remote operating at one you know, in five years' time. So it's a difficult one to call. I, I don't know. It depends on the technology really, because I think we're not quite there with the technology in terms of our sort of internet data capabilities and five G. So. I think that would have to be dramatically improve um, before I think we could say it's safe enough for for me to either be in a different hospital operating on someone else or being at home. Okay, so it's it's all about the, the need. I mean, uh, having uh, like uh, yeah. very large countries and uh, the infrastructure, yeah. uh, the capabilities to uh, to have this uh, information going back and forth between the console and the and the bedside units and uh, and also uh, uh, what 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 you need in your in your in your own country. All right, so I want to uh, to end this episode here because it's already uh, one hour. Thank you very much uh, for uh, making the time uh, for me today, Dr. Patel. Have you anything to, to add on, on your practice, robotic practice, and uh, the versus robot before we wrap up? Oh, I think I think that if you want, it doesn't matter whether you want a versus or a Da Vinci or a Hugo. I think if you want to buy a, a robot in your institution, just just champion it and, and get one. Um, uh, and start robotic surgery is my is my, is my take home message. You know, um, um, it's a fantastic way of operating, um, and I'd wish I'd done it sooner. Um, cool. But uh, thank you, thank you for inviting me on the show, and it's uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, Lucian. Thanks, great message uh, about the championing and, and choosing whichever robotic model is uh, is uh, suited to your practice and uh, hospital and uh, patient population. Thank you all for listening to the uh, Less Invasive Podcast, your source for minimally invasive surgery and robotics and also other assistive technologies in the operating room, such as virtual reality, augmented reality, AI, telepresence, and more. Thank you for listening and uh, to the next show.